I enjoy coming to neonatal conferences for a, a very personal reason. My youngest was born at 28 weeks, just around 1.2 kilos, had BPD, had medical neck, grade four IVH, transfused, spent nearly three months in hospital, uh, maternity, uh, neonatal hospital in Melbourne, and uh, has done extraordinarily well. He's now 33 and a CPA and has a thriving life. So I wanna thank you all. You mean a, a huge amount to me and my family. I've also been very privileged in my career. I've had the opportunity to work in Melbourne, uh, Royal Children's Hospital, where I trained. Uh, and it's nice to be the second Australian on the panel this morning. I spent 20 years at Boston Children's um, in the uh, cardiac anesthesia, cardiac ICU programs there, then eight years in, at Sick Kids, where I ran the Department of Critical Care and then came back to Boston Children's in uh, 2020 in my current role. I still work in the cardiac ICU. I still have a research lab and I, and I have this administrative role in the C-suite. It's actually given me a unique perspective as to the dynamics of the field we work in and the pressures we all feel and the value of the data that we've generated that will transform the way we deliver care. I'm firmly convinced that that will be the case. But data isn't enough. It's really what you do with it. We talk about data, technology, and humans. That's the interaction that you all have in your intensive care unit. And we often get that order wrong. It's data, technology, humans. It's humans interacting with data that generated from technology by which we derive intelligence. Every one of us matters here. That's the key. So I have a number of disclosures. Um, I've been working in this field for quite some time, a platform that represents data, um, another platform that an architect that helps manage the data that we capture, another that uh, looks at the uh, use of data as an app for resuscitation in children with heart disease, and then risk management. The most important thing for me in my experience down this journey is not the data. It's how you manage it, and it's how you get actionable intelligence. And that really depends so much on your team and the purpose that you create. The faces on this screen here are just incredible people. They're doctors, nurses, they're data scientists, physicists, engineers, machine learning experts, human factors experts. That's the package. That's what brings the data to life. And so whatever we talk about modeling and all the other things that you'll hear, this is key. You have to generate that sort of team to bring it to life. Because if you don't bring it to life, you will not translate it. And if you don't translate it, it's just a waste. So we have to be really mindful of the teams we build to do so. I think also we have to define what, are the, what we want to solve. And I look at this in this particular schema. On the y-axis is how we adapt and behave. On the x-axis is the degree of uncertainty in, in whatever situation we find ourselves. So in this bottom left-hand box here, standard work, consistent work, it's no, no uncertainty. You don't need to adapt, just do it. And you would think that's where we should be operating most of the time, but I can tell you in your NICUs, just like in my cardiac ICU, that's about 25, 30% of your time. It's not as common as you think. More common is where there is really no uncertainty, but people are doing different things, they're adapting. And then maybe because they've had to, because the system around them isn't uh, conducive for their workflow, 
but that's also known as sort of the illegal normal. I see it really as the learning zone because in this bottom work where there's no uncertainty and you just do the work, checklist work, you don't need artificial intelligence here. In this section here where there's variability, there's no uncertainty, but people are doing it slightly different ways. That's really about, that's where, first of all, latent safety threats occur in our units. And that's, where, that's a human factors component. We need to understand our system and the way in which people are working. It's not solved by artificial intelligence. On the other hand, these two on the right where there's a lot of uncertainty, we either have to adapt to it, in other words, be very resilient and respond to the evolving circumstances, that's critical. That's what we train for, all of you. And we certainly never want to be rigid where there's a lot of uncertainty and we're just staying fixed down a pathway and not responding as we need to. This is where, in my mind, artificial intelligence is going to change the way we work. It will prevent us being rigid and will allow us to respond and be resilient and eventually predictive. Now, there's a huge amount of data that's been generated in our units. This is uh, Ken Mandel at Boston Children's uses the term the tapestry of data, which you can see on, the, uh, on, on your left-hand side of the screen here. Uh, it's true. And then if you look at, uh, to Leif's point about BPD, if you take all of the genomic, transcriptomic, metabolomic, proteomic data, mix it with population health, and all the other data that's streaming in, we're going to really understand the phenotype of a patient much, much better. All of that data is now coming together. It's aggregating. It's our ability to access it and utilize it that's key. Of course, if you look at our area or just around continuous physiologic monitoring, that's a small component of the overall tapestry of data. Being able to connect all that's really important. And I think it's also important to understand about, to think about data in two ways. There's what's called the uh, prognostic enrichment of data. And that's the data that you see in the electronic health record. It's really quite transactional. You see it in registries. And it often focuses on a patient population. Um, it doesn't, uh, it, it allows comparison, allows you to share. Uh, it allows you to communicate risk, gives you the what and the when. What it doesn't give you though, uh, are the causality. So it's very good for operational issues. And we use it at Boston Children's, as I'm sure many of your hospitals do as well, to understand things like workflow, capacity management, and things like that. Finances is another good example. But it's really hard to determine causality of an event or a physiologic state because we don't capture our decisions within it and we infer decisions based on whatever change might have occurred. Blood pressure was low, increased your epinephrine infusion. Somebody's thought, well, that must be because the heart needs some augmenting, uh, augmenting in terms of contractility. You know, those sort of inferences don't help us. We need to be able to capture our decisions better. So there's a huge amount of data in the EHR, incredibly important, but understand the limitations of it. The other form of data is this predictive enrichment of data, which is your biologic response to illness. And to, and to treatment. Um, it brings in physiologic biomarkers, omics. And for me, it's been about trying to understand the physiologic state of a patient and the risk for an event within that state. That's how I think about critical care. You start then to get to more individualized or precise care. You start to understand perhaps some aspects of causality but there's still going to be inference within that. Once again, we are very bad at capturing our decisions, actually decisions for and decisions why we're not going to do something. It's important to bring that forward. There's a vast amount of data here. It needs an, a structure and it's a problem because there's no standards around physiologic data. There are different libraries, there are different terminology, different acronyms used by different companies to describe the same thing. We need to get to a standardization very quickly on this to really use it. But just as an example of how this can be used, this is data out of Hector, by Hector Wong, who uh, most unfortunately passed away last year, uh, but just a seminal researcher and clinician in pediatric critical care. And Hector's work 
really looked at combining both the prognostic and the predictive data to really understand the impact of steroids in treating septic shock. Now, he shows it, what Hector gave us was a pathway. And this is the type of pathway we need to follow in my mind going forward. Now, I mentioned that the huge amount of data that's streaming into us, well, we need an architecture for that. There's no off-the-shelf product. There is no off-the-shelf product that will do this. This data that all of you see every day in your ICUs is high-frequency, time-series data. It's subject to bottle, bottlenecks. It's what's called being input-output bound, I-O bound. Capturing that data is one thing. Being able to store it is another. But there's no point storing it if you can't use it or access it. So you've got to be able to actually take this massive amount of data, decompress it, but compress it and then decompress it rapidly so that you can actually use it in your clinical uh, systems. So we've focused at Sick Kids on trying to solve that problem and developed an architecture um, that we call HMDB and uh, Jai Maswi, who will be speaking here on Wednesday, um, and Andrew Goodwin, PhD scientist in our group, developed this amazing ability to capture all of this data streaming from every device, every monitor at the bedside. But not only to do that, to store it in a really efficient way that allows you to then to access the data. So this was a hurdle we had to overcome and we spent a lot of time trying to do it because there's no point capturing the data if you can't use it, is there? How much data are we talking about? Well, this is a Boston Children's on our platform called T3. This is uh, data to the end of 21 but we have over 150,000 patients now uh, collecting data. We have over uh, now over uh, 14 million hours of data on patients from our NICU, cardiac ICU, MS ICU, medicine ICU, operating rooms. We're capturing all the physiologic data. It's digital data, it's not waveform data, but it's at five second intervals. And that, am that amount of data is fantastic because now we can start to look at not only patient populations, but drill down precisely into individual patients as well. Sick so kids, we not only collect all of that categorical or five second data, we also collect all the waveform data. And that was the key aspect of developing that platform. Developing the waveform data just takes it to another level in terms of the amount of information that's available. So right now, Sick kids is collecting around 500 signals uh, per hour or from 500 devices. It's about 25,000 points of data every second. And we're now just over 5 trillion data points in our database. The efficiency of that database is that we can store it in just over a terabyte and we can access it in, and bring that data forward in we're getting up from a billion of data, billions of data points per second. We've still got some ways to go. But it's getting closer to being real time and at the bedside, which is what we all need. That's what's, what's important here. We also have to pay attention to what I call artifactual intelligence. We all know that our babies move and they get managed appropriately by uh, all sorts of care. It leads to artifacts and signals. And this is just the arterial line. These are 20 different artifacts that we have categorized in the ICU at Sick Kids. And it's possible to label these artifacts and incorporate those labels in the data sets. We don't want to get rid of those artifacts, by the way. We don't want to be keeping the raw data is really important because there's a lot of information in artifacts, the frequency of them, the types of artifacts. So we don't want to get rid of them, but we need to be able to to label them. So I'm not worried about artifacts from that aspect. We can manage them, we just have to understand them. I am concerned about time because all of our data that's stream, particularly the high frequency data, has a time component to it. It's time series data. And the way we capture time in our intensive care units right now is terrible. The way various devices and vendors capture time is just not standardized. And if you can see here, if at the, when an event occurs, somebody will look at the clock and that'll give you an estimation. But 
and then somebody will say, well, actually it was before that or after that. And then you start to feed in erroneous times with an event and you try to then characterize the physiologic signals with that event and you find that they're actually misaligned. And in fact, if you look up on this, uh, on your uh, right-hand side here, the physiologic values and derived waveforms are really quite imprecise when you relate them to consumer grade anatomic clocks. So we need to be aware that the way we capture time in our ICUs is bad. When I first started as a kid, as an example, when we were collecting all this data, one of um, my colleagues came up and said to me, why are we on uh, Greenwich Mean Time for our clocks with the physiologic data? I said, what do you mean? What? I said, no, the, the computers and the, and the monitors had all been set for Greenwich Mean Time and not for time in Toronto. It's because nobody really cared. Nobody just kept collecting the data. Nobody needed to worry about it until you start collecting it. So we made those corrections, but time is important. And then finally, I would say is appreciate the variability and you will see this in your patients. Variability in your signals is key. Loss of variability is an indication of illness. Recovery of variability is an indication of recovery. So of, from, from the illness. And in this particular circumstance, you can see the variability here on, the, on your left-hand side of uh, heart rate, SpO2, and blood pressure. Now, as you increase the time interval between which you are measuring and capturing the, those signals, the variability decreases. So that if you put something in a medical record at four-hour intervals, there will be very little variability in those signals. The shorter the time frame, the greater the variability you'll capture. You all see it every day in your, in your NICUs. You look at your monitors and you can see that variability in heart rate, rising, falling, blood pressure changes, all of that. We don't capture it in our current electronic health records and we need to be able to make sure we can. So variability, time, and artifacts, really important. I'm not gonna talk about models, but they have to be, have, I have the four R's for models. They need to be reliable, replicable, relevant, and representable. They need to reflect what we do. And so this is the T3 uh, platform that we put together at uh, Boston Children's. I'm not gonna go through it. It's an architecture that allows us to capture all this data, look at it, zoom in, zoom out, real time, um, permanent uh, display, all of those sort of aspects. But it allows us to interact with all of the data that's streaming from the bedside. It's also a hosting platform because whatever models get developed, you need to see them and understand them and utilize them. So I wanted a platform that would host a model. Um, and this is one example. This is what's called the inadequate oxygen delivery index. We started first looking at the babies with transposition physiology and then added babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And then we took it from newborns to infants up to 10 years of age, and now it's extended into adults. It was a gradual process bringing in more and more data and, and changing the age range. Now, a couple of important points. This is a Bayesian model. It's taking in about 10 different signals at five second increments, and that model is a machine learning model that it just keeps looking at the data that it's receiving now, comparing to the model, the data that it had been receiving, and makes an estimation as to the adequacy of oxygen delivery. The higher the red bar, the more inadequate that oxygen delivery. Key point, it's an estimation. And that's one of the fundamental things we need to be appreciative of in our ICUs is that we're not binary. The data that will be coming to you and the type of models like this are not gonna tell you what to do. They are additional information that you need to absorb. The human with data is so important. It's not the data to the human. This is another example of using this type of information. So this is IDO2 um, and uh, Craig Futterman at uh, DC Children's wanted to see whether you could predict a cardiac arrest. So we've got a physiologic state of low oxygen delivery 
is it likely to, how does it help you predict a cardiac arrest? And what he found was, in fact, there's a dosing period. So now we've got a dose of a physiologic state. The duration of time that you are at a particular state is more important. And then uh, Michael Goldsmith um, also looked at how we might use it to wean from vasoactive support. We didn't look at it how to start it, but I, I don't know in your units, but we can get stuck on a on a milrodone in particular <laughs> that will stay on it for a period of time, although the patient's recovered, doesn't need to be on it, but people like to, well, let's just leave it on during weaning, let's leave it on for this or that reason. Michael was able to demonstrate that we can actually use this type of information like that index I showed you to actually wean off much more quickly. So there are also associations, and this is uh, children undergoing either a transposition arterial switch procedure or stage one palliation to a hyperplastic left heart syndrome that's in, in Toronto. And Jessica Nichols took these 77 patients and we know that these patients are at risk for new MRI evidence of brain injury in the perioperative period. And you can see that there was nearly 40% in the single ventricle group and 32% in the transposition group. High risk. And so she looked at all the various signals that were streaming through this to try and determine is there in the ICU, should we be focusing on blood pressure or heart rate or oxygen saturation? What, what is the signal? And when she looked at all of these signals here, none stood out. There was not one signal. But then uh, Jessica with, uh, with Danny Aiden then looked at uh, component analysis and was able to demonstrate that the real risk for new injury in these patients was really low oxygen saturation, high blood pressure, and high heart rate. So now we're starting to get some better picture as to the constellation and the interaction of these signals. This is where we will head. And then I think we'll head into something even different, and this is how we represent it. And on, the, uh, on your right-hand side here is just looking at those three signals and how they relate and the perturbation that occurs within those signals. That's not real time yet, but that's the type of work that I think is going to be very important. So I've talked about data and models a little. The usability of this information depends on a couple of points. How explainable it is, how believable it is to all of us, and then finally, how it actionable it is. How does it change our behaviors? And there have been this particular article I have here, Do No Harm, A Roadmap for Responsible Machine Learning, it's, it's very helpful. It doesn't get to the humans. And so I've been working with Patricia Trowbridge and Sonia Pinckney at Sick Kids, human factors experts, and we really tried to study our workflow and the adoption of new intelligence or new tools within our workflow. And the first thing we did was try to understand how people think. So these are critical care docs, bringing in new information or a new device into the ICU. And so their central process for all of these physicians was, make, was problem solving. And so they, wouldn't, they felt that there had to be, it had to make sense, either the tool or the data coming to them. Sense making was critical to those group of pediatric intensive care physicians. And I bet it's the same on, on the NICU as well. If you look at it from a nursing side, they have a different requirement around their macrocognition, and that is around managing complexity. It's about time and the uncertainty and the risk management. They are different frameworks. We have to appreciate that whenever we're bringing a device or a tool into the ICU, doesn't mean one's better than the other, but they're different frameworks. And then the other is we have to understand what the signals are. There's the perception of the signal where there's a, often a lot of noise and we have to bring that signal out from the noise and AI could help us boost that signal as an early warning system, but could also make it a lot more or could add more noise. The other component is decision-making. So what do you do with the signal that, you, that you've now recognized? And that is recognizing the patterns, the comprehension of the patterns and the changes over time. And this is, this is really important when we are putting new equipment, 
technology or data into the uh, into our intensive care units and appreciate that we have an environment with experts and non-experts and that how people are using that data is really important. The experts in general will tend to look for, will have a, a, a range of differential diagnoses and will be looking for ways to disprove what they're thinking. They're always, it's not second guessing. It's always about looking, questioning, am I thinking about this the right way? Is there some other data coming in? Whereas the data around our junior faculty and residents is that's much more sequential, much more fixed on this is what we think it is and sequentially going through it. Once again, that's not wrong. It's just the nature of our experience and the training that we receive. Artificial intelligence should be able to really reduce that learning curve, should it help boost the junior trainees, junior faculty, and support the older faculty, i.e. me, as we degrade. It should be able to even that out. That's my hope anyway. Because we need to develop a sustainable system where there is the use of our, not only our systems, but to understand our macro cognition. Boston Children's, we've got a program that we call Aligned Intelligence. We're not talking about artificial, we're talking about alignment of data from all other sources and alignment of people with that data. Because in the end, we need a human engineering approach to the way we're gonna bring intelligence into our systems. And this on, the, uh, on your left-hand side here is really that scrum approach to data. It's not sequential. It's getting people together, understanding your problem, and then having multiple rapid iterative cycles of discovery. And as the Asadi uh, put together this, most, this uh, uh, schema here on your right, which really shows you the various components that as he has identified that we need to have when we're developing out our AI and models, and it's the human within the technical system within the overall environment. And this to me is the key final component here. We all have systems in which we work. We need to modify our systems so that we can enable the people and teams within that system to be the best possible they can and provide them with the data and the resources and the technology to do so. With that, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, once again, a pleasure for the invitation. Thank you very much.